Hey everyone, welcome to my day in the life series here on white coats and corgis. Most of you probably know me from Instagram or TikTok where I make helpful free content for pre-meds and talk about my journey as a first generation medical student. My mission here on YouTube is to give pre-med students all the information they need for a career in medicine. So in order to do that, I've teamed up with Med School Coach to create this series where I'm going to do a deep dive on each medical specialty. And I want to start off by saying that it can be really difficult to accumulate the number of shadowing hours you really need to be accepted into medical school. And especially nowadays, this can be really challenging. A lot of physicians aren't open to shadowing opportunities in person the way that they were before. So that is why a med school coach decided to collaborate with over 20 doctors to give you a behind the scenes look at practically every specialty that you might be interested in. And this is all completely free. You can go to shadowing.medschoolcoach.com, register for the program, and then you get to choose whichever specialties you're interested in to shadow. At the end, you can fill out a short quiz and then they'll give you a certificate of completion. That way you can count these hours on your medical school application. I'm going to talk about uh, the profession of orthopedic surgery in general uh, and my own experience uh, and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, what is orthopedic surgery? Um, orthopedic surgery is the treatment of musculoskeletal disorders, and that includes the treatment of bones, muscles, ligaments, tendons, nerves, and the skin and soft tissue. Uh, it's fairly comprehensive. It, it includes just about everything outside of the head and the abdomen, um, but I do know some orthopedic surgeons that will venture into the back part of the skull and the front of the spine here, and also uh, we'll, we'll do some rib, rib surgeries as well as uh, some abdominal flaps. So uh, it doesn't necessarily limit you to these things. I think the field of orthopedic surgery is very wide and all, almost all-encompassing. Treatment is largely geared at restoring function and eliminating pain. There's many reasons why people seek out an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, typically, we all think of a broken bone as a reason to go seek out an orthopedic surgeon, but chronic debilitating arthritis, low back pain, numbness and tingling in the fingers, these are all reasons why people seek out certain subspecialists. Uh, pain is usually uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why people seek out help in the first place. And then when the etiology of that pain is deemed to be something that's related to the musculoskeletal system, often those patients are referred to us. Um, orthopedic surgery requires an in-depth knowledge of many surgical subspecialties blended into one, principles of general surgery, plastic surgery, uh, neurology and neurosurgery with peripheral nerve surgery, uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, and even physical therapy. So uh, it is a, a fairly wide uh, encompassing practice. I think these are some images that are representative of some of the types of injuries that we see on a not so irregular basis. This is, I think, what classically comes to mind when people see or think of an orthopedic surgeon. We deal with a lot of uh, radiology and uh, medical imaging. These are x-rays of various body parts ranging from a forearm on the left to a distal humerus in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, and then this is the, the bottom middle image on the left is probably what uh, Tiger Woods just had and that, that came out in the news recently. He had a shattered uh, tibia and a fibula fracture. So uh, um, that's a, a part of the lower extremity. And I think these are classic images uh, of what we think of as orthopedic surgeons, but it's not just that. Um, orthopedic surgeons then treat these fractures and bo broken bones and problems with a variety of tools. Uh, we call those implants or medical devices. Um, usually they're made out of a stainless steel alloy or titanium in some instances or various blends of metal. And these may be representative of some of the things you can pick up at Home Depot. We put in uh, plates, we put in screws, we put in bands, we put in wires, uh, we put in rods, um, and these are all part of our literal toolbox. From a day to day, what does the life of an orthopedic surgery look? Uh, an orthopedic surgeon look like? Well, I think there's significant variety based on a specialty, and the specialties within orthopedic surgery are are many. There are hand surgeons, there are joint replacement surgeons, there are spine surgeons, there are foot and ankle surgeons, uh, there are sports trained surgeons, there are uh, fellowships in trauma surgery, shoulder and elbow surgery, 
a newer burgeoning field that uh, that's a hybrid between neurosurgery and plastic surgery is called orthoplastics or reconstructive microsurgery. Um, that deals with uh, connecting uh, cut nerves and even uh, doing nerve transfers to uh, increase or provide functionality to uh, patients' uh, limbs. Um, there are general orthopedic surgeons, so people that do that just do a little bit of everything. Um, and then there are orthopedic oncologists, so tumors of the musculoskeletal system. And then finally, there is a field dedicated just to children in pediatric orthopedics. All of these are fellowships that you can do after you finish your orthopedic surgery residency training. And we'll talk about the residency and fellowship uh, process in just a minute. Um, but the the day to day life and what types of patients you see as an orthopedic surgeon can vary tremendously based on uh, your type of practice and also what kind of surgeon you choose to be. Uh, if you're a general orthopedic surgeon, you'll see a little bit of everything that walks through the door. Um, in today's day and age, I think there's a trend towards increasing subspecialization. Uh, so within the field of orthopedic surgery, you'll have at a single hospital or a practice, you'll have multiple fellowship trained orthopedic surgeons, each covering a different domain of the body. So the hand surgeons will deal with the upper extremity. Uh, the joint replacement surgeons will typically do joint replacement surgery and complications that may arise from that. Spine surgeons do spine surgery, foot and ankle surgeons do foot and ankle surgery, et cetera. Um, that is increasingly common as time goes on. Um, there is a mix of inpatient versus outpatient surgery. Uh, there, again, there is an increasing trend towards uh, uh, the ability to operate as an outpatient. So patients come in, they do a regional anesthetic, meaning that they have a peripheral nerve block from the anesthesiologist that numbs their extremity that they're getting operated on. They have the surgery, which could last uh, you know, less than an hour to multiple hours, and then they go home the same day. Uh, that's termed outpatient surgery. Inpatient surgery uh, typically is reserved for more complicated or risky procedures or patients that may be at a higher risk of having surgery. So they either have multiple comorbidities uh, that preclude them from being operated on as an outpatient or they may have uh, multiple traumatic injuries and they may not be stable enough to have surgery done as an outpatient. Say for instance, a patient who got into a motor vehicle accident that has multiple problems and not just musculoskeletal complaints. So say maybe they have abdominal injuries that general surgery or trauma surgery is managing, uh, but they also happen to have a forearm fracture. Well, those patients typically will be managed in the hospital until they are well enough to be discharged outside the hospital. So as an orthopedic surgeon, you will manage both inpatient and outpatient surgeries. And then finally, um, there are multiple types of practices and uh, it's, it's largely up to you which type of practice you wish to join. You can do academic medicine where you work at a major academic medical center. Uh, and typically academic orthopedic surgeons are subspecialized and there may be multiple uh, subspecialists within your own department. You can still go into private practice Private practices can be multi-specialties. So you may have uh, any of these varieties of specialties in your practice, or it could be single specialty. You could join a predominantly upper extremity practice, or you could join a predominantly uh, sports practice. Um, and even you could just be a surgical practice and you could have orthopedic surgeons and also urologists and ear, nose and throat doctors also working at the same service center that you uh, may have a share or stakehold in. And then finally, there are orthopedic surgeons that are employed physicians. So they're employed by a hospital system and there are many hospital systems throughout the country. That's typically how orthopedic surgery works and, and the variety of practices that exist. Um, so what is my data or how much, I guess so we should go on to that. How much do orthopedic surgeons earn? Typically they're at the higher end of the spectrum. Uh, and this varies from year to year. Um, in this particular year, uh, orthopedic surgeons were at the top of the list. Now, if you go into subspecializations, uh, uh, increasingly at the top of the list, there are interventional cardiologists. So the, they who place minimally invasive, who place stents and other valve replacements minimally invasively and neurosurgeons or spine surgeons also tend to be at the top of the list. This is in general, this list here is, uh, uh, general practitioners. So in general, orthopedic surgeons are well compensated for what they do. I would say the average orthopedic surgeon probably works about 60 hours a week. Uh, that's about 12 hours a day or less, but then taking call on the nights or the weekends. 
Um, so I think from a work-life uh, balance standpoint, it's very good. I don't have any complaints about my work-life balance. I think in any profession, uh, your work-life balance is what you make of it. You can do anything you want to as a physician and you can be as busy or not as busy as you wish to. Um, and uh, I wouldn't shy away from joining a surgical subspecialty or a surgical specialty um, because you think that you're not gonna have enough time to have a work-life balance. Um, I think the field of orthopedic surgery is increasing. It has historically been underrepresented by, uh, by women, but that trend is reversing and there are increasing numbers of women that are choosing to go into orthopedic surgery and many surgical subspecialties uh, outside of orthopedics. I think it's a phenomenal field for just about anyone uh, who wishes to do that. And so the work-life balance, is, I think, is fine. And um, uh, they will differ depending on what type of orthopedic surgeon you are. If you are a trauma surgeon and you are on call more, you may not have as much of a work-life balance as someone who operates almost exclusively at an outpatient surgery center where those typically are open only between the hours of 7 and 5 p.m. So um, that's a little bit about the lifestyle uh, and compensation of an orthopedic surgeon. Um, how do you become an orthopedic surgeon? Well, you have to match into an orthopedic residency, and then fellowship is optional. Um, I think most people choose to do a fellowship uh, these days, and uh, I think for good reason, because we're increasingly subspecialized, but the number of surgeries and what we can do as orthopedic surgeons is expanding uh, on a on a day to day basis. The operations that we were able to do 20 years ago are are far and few between compared to the operations that we can do today. Um, and uh, I think the number of surgeries and the scope of practice that has increased uh, offers the uh, increasing interest in doing more training. And some people choose to do even two or three fellowships uh, because they want to become a certain type of sub sub specialized surgeon that only specializes in say hip preservation surgery uh, or a specific type of pediatric surgery. Typically an orthopedic surgery residency will have one to 14 residents per year. Uh, there are about 120 plus programs in the United States and about 800 to 900 residents will match per year. It is competitive. I would say that's probably about 75% of the applicants. So 25 to 35% of people will end up not matching into orthopedics uh, and, and will have to either reapply or do something else. Um, orthopedic surgery residency is five clinical years. As an intern, you'll do six months of general surgery and other rotations that are foundational for the practice of orthopedics, including radiology uh, and, and managing patients in an intensive care unit. Some programs do have an optional research year for interested residents. Uh, so though that makes their residency program six years. Typically those slots you have to apply to directly. So if you're interested in doing a research year as part of your residency program, you may have to apply specifically to that spot at that program. Um, Intern year typically is a mix of floor management and the introduction to the operative experience. Each program introduces their residents to the operative experience uh, differently. Some programs will have a, a large operative component to their intern year and some programs will not have a large operative component to their intern year. Intern year is important for you to learn how to take care of patients after surgery, before surgery, and any complications that are medical that arise from surgery. Um, PGY two year or the second year of residency is typically the consult year. So you carry a pager and when there are emergencies or traumas, such as the one that we saw previously on the slide previously, when those come into the emergency department, you usually are the first line clinician. They will call you and say, I have an orthopedic consult for you. And you will go see that patient in the emergency department. Um, there in, is a trend towards uh, adding increasing operative responsibilities as a second year resident. Uh, and then third, years three through five typically are largely operative. You, you usually will still have a mix of call in there. Um, you will have chief resident responsibilities and you will be directly responsible for directing the management of patients that come into the emergency department. You may not be the one physically evaluating the patient, but your junior residents, when you're a chief resident, will run consults by you. They'll call you and they'll ask you for your help. They'll ask you what to do with the patient. Uh, there's sort of a, a ladder approach to um, 
to managing patients uh, and determining how, how to treat them best. Um, and then when you graduate, you have the option to complete a, a fellowship. All fellowships in orthopedic surgery are, are one year. There are a handful of two-year fellowships that typically add on a research component, but that's not common. Um, so any of the fellowships that we previously talked about, sports, foot and ankle surgery, spine surgery, all of those are one extra year of subspecialization where you pretty much just do that type of surgery. Um, so the match process, if you don't match, you'll typically receive an email on the Monday of match week that says, I'm sorry, you did not match. Then there's the opportunity to participate in what is uh, layman's terms called the scramble. And you can, uh, there are, the match process is not perfect. There are, every year are, are unfilled slots of residency programs across the country and, and just about every specialty. Depending on the year and how competitive it is and how the match process works, there may or may not be available orthopedic residency slots that went unfilled. If there are, you have the chance to vie for those through the scramble process, uh, in which case you continually apply. Program directors may call you and say, I have an open slot here. I'd like you to rank this. So there's, a, there's multiple match processes that go on Monday through Thursday of match week if you don't match, uh, depending on what slots didn't match. So if you don't match and there is an, an orthopedic residency slot that also went unfilled, you have the opportunity to match in that program. If unfortunately, uh, as tends to be the case, there are no uh, unfilled orthopedic surgery spots, you could vie for anything else that you may have interest in. Um, so you could vie for an internal medicine spot or you could vie for a general surgery spot or a neurosurgery spot uh, if those are of interest to you. Typically, students that don't match have, uh, have, two, have two options. You can either uh, vie for what's called a preliminary slot in general surgery, where you start your intern year and you do a year of general surgery. Um, that, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Or you can take time off and delay your graduation and do that year of research that I was talking about before, where you partner with an orthopedic surgeon you do research for them and then you reapply the following year with a stronger application, better letters of recommendation, perhaps, and hopefully more publications. Um, the success rate for students that tend to do that is good. Uh, they've reworked their application, they've thought through the reasons of why they did not match and they strengthened their application with better letters and uh, with uh, better network connections and, and more papers. Right. Um, if you choose to uh, go ahead and match into a preliminary general surgery spot or a preliminary spot in some other specialty, um, that, that year that you start your residency is it. You have to find another job after that year. So it's not a guaranteed or categorical residency position. So you start your residency program and you finish your intern year. But during your intern year, you'll have to apply through the match again to any subspecialty. Doing an intern year in a preliminary general surgery spot allows you the opportunity to apply into a variety of specialties, ranging from radiology to uh, vascular surgery. And typically there are multiple slots that open up throughout the year or even beyond. The advantage to doing that is that you have the ability then to not only apply for intern spots across the country in various specialties that you qualify for, there's no right or wrong approach to doing that. It just depends on uh, that student who unfortunately didn't match their interests, their life goals, their family uh, responsibilities, and their overall application. It is competitive and not everyone is qualified to get into orthopedic surgery um, based on you know, the metrics that, uh, that programs are looking for. And so it is often a difficult conversation to have with those students. Um, and it is disappointing when you don't match, um, but it's not the end of the world. There are, they, you know, they say where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I think for the motivated and diligent and dedicated student that's willing to be a little bit creative and definitely work very hard, uh, you can certainly end up doing what you want to do even down the road. There are four different ways to become a hand surgeon. You can do general surgery, followed by a plastic surgery fellowship, followed by a hand fellowship that typically takes five to seven years for general surgery, 
uh, three-year plastic surgery fellowship and a one-year hand fellowship. That's a long time. But there are plenty of people across the country that do that. There are plenty of general surgery trained hand surgeons. Uh, and that is the route to become one. You can do what I did, orthopedic surgery, which is five years and a one-year hand surgery fellowship. That's the fastest way to get there. You can do plastic surgery, which tends to be about six years, sometimes seven, depending on the program, because they usually have a research component integrated into the plastic surgery residency program, and then followed by a one-year hand fellowship. And then finally, the most exotic that I've ever heard of, and yes, there are surgeons around the country that have trained this way, you can do otolaryngology, which is ear, nose, and throat surgery, followed by a plastic surgery fellowship, followed by a hand surgery fellowship. Wow. So... When they say where there's a will, there's a way, there is. You can you can become a hand surgeon if that's what you choose to be uh, four different ways. So um, any other questions about those? All right. So my typical week, I said I'm a fellowship trained hand surgeon. I typically have two to three days of clinic. I'll see anywhere from 25 to 60 patients on any given clinic day, depending on how busy it is. <laughs> Um, and then depending on the week, I may operate two to three days during that week. Those are typically elective surgeries. So patients that I see as an outpatient that come to my office um, and we discuss their, their needs and their desires for surgery and that they are scheduled electively, typically at an outpatient surgery center. And that is where I operate. Um, if there are any inpatients, I will round on those throughout the week uh, as needed. Hand surgery tends to be a fairly good work-life balance uh, because it is largely outpatient surgery. I rarely have inpatients. The only inpatients that I typically have are those that uh, I needed to operate on who had multiple comorbidities, as we discussed, or who had um, um, surgeries that were riskier or who had traumatic uh, events and they were unstable and they came into the uh, emergency department and were admitted as an inpatient. I do take call. Call responsibilities vary from practice to practice. Uh, there are practices where you don't have to take call. And then there are practices where you might be on call for a week or more at a time, 24 seven. There are two types of, two or three different types of call as an orthopedic surgeon. You can take general orthopedic call. So any orthopedic complaint that comes into an emergency department, they just call you because you're the general orthopedic surgeon or you're the orthopedic surgeon taking orthopedic surgery call. Sometimes hospitals will parse out a specific hand surgery call. Uh, so if they have someone that has an amputation of their finger or a laceration to the hand or any traumatic hand event, they will call whoever is on the hand surgery call schedule. Sometimes those call schedules are shared with plastic surgeons. Uh, or maybe even the ear, nose, and throat surgeon that did their fellowship training in hand surgery. Um, finally, there are, patient, there are uh, uh, hospitals that will offer a spine call. So spine trauma uh, tends to be only neurosurgeons and fellowship trained spine surgeons that will take spine dedicated spine call. Um, so I don't take spine call because I'm not a fellowship trained spine surgeon. But those are the, typically the three types of call that you may encounter as an orthopedic surgeon. So that's my typical week on any given basis. All right, so time for some clinical cases. So this uh, case is a 14 month old female who had a history of right thumb aplasia. Aplasia means a lack of a body part. So this person was born without a thumb. Notably, she did have a family history of the mom also was born without a thumb. Um, so a little bit about thumb aplasia or hypoplasia. Um, this spectrum of disorder is a range of underdevelopment to complete absence of the thumb. Uh, so our patient had no thumb, uh, but sometimes there is an underdeveloped uh, or, or stump of a thumb that, that may or may not be functional. It's often associated with partial or total absence of the radius bone. The radius bone is the one in the forearm on the radial side or the thumb side of the arm. Um, it has an incidence of one out of every 100,000 live births uh, around the world. It is often associated, as you can imagine, with other congenital anomalies. So patients may be born uh, with other problems, not just limited to the musculoskeletal system, but they may have, um, and the most common one is called bactrial anomalies. So uh, they have problems with their vascular system, abdomen, things like that. Treatment for patients that are diagnosed with thumb aplasia or hypoplasia, Again, just like most orthopedic surgery is aimed at restoring function and also depends how, on how much of the thumb is missing. In this patient's case, a polycization was indicated. A polycization uh, basically means you make one of the other fingers on your hand into a thumb. 
So you take typically the index finger and you will move it into the position where the thumb used to be. And you will do tendon transfers uh, to, that, to that index finger to allow it to have the motion and mobility of the thumb. The thumb, uh, as we are human, is probably the most important digit in the hand because that's what allows us to have what we call opposition or taking the thumb, moving it across the palm. It allows us to grasp, it allows us to grip. Um, that, that's what distinguishes us from many other animals. Uh, so restoring function and restoring the, the existence of the thumb is very important. It is important to address this uh, when children are young because their brain then uh, is still what we call plastic. It has plasticity, meaning the brain can relearn things. You can do polycizations in adults. Uh, there are sometimes indications for uh, doing polycizations in adults when they have traumatic amputations of the thumb. Uh, and in which case you would take their index finger, you would shorten it and you would make it into their thumb. In adults, they do tend to do well, but it may require more training because their brains are not as plastic as, uh, as children are. So doing this before they have uh, compensated, if you will, uh, for the lack of the thumb is important. So here are the initial images of our patient. As you can see, this is her hand and there is no thumb. Um, the left image is the palmar side of the hand and the right image is the dorsal side uh, of the hand. And you can see there just, she was born without a thumb. Um, in this case, uh, there, the, the other structures that go to the thumb uh, were underdeveloped and they may not be as robust as uh, patients that have a, say a partial thumb. So in some instances, patients may have a stub of a thumb or a remnant of a thumb. So their body was trying to make a thumb, it just didn't succeed all the way. And in those patients, they tend to have uh, more structures that are uh, easily identifiable, um, or they may have very robust structures that, you know, may say they, uh, they had, um, you know, some of the muscles that were still intact, they just weren't as developed. Uh, in this case, because you didn't have a thumb, most of those structures were somewhat absent. I see. So as you can say, this is our post-operative image here. Um, we've taken the index finger uh, and we have moved it into the position of the thumb. Uh, some of that requires a little bit of plastic surgery. So we do tissue rearrangement. We design what we call flaps or skin incisions based on where we want the thumb to end up. And then the tissue is rotated or moved around in place to fill the defect from moving the thumb. As you can imagine, if you took your index finger and you shifted it and you rotated it into the position where the thumb would be, uh, that could leave some tissue gaps. And the way we design the skin incisions is to, to make those tissue gaps not as prominent. So uh, as you can also imagine, the tendons that go to the fingers here are different than the ones that go to the thumb because the thumb has much more uh, mobility and has uh, different tendons that go to it than your fingers, which have flexor and extensor tendons. Uh, the thumb also has tendons that allow you to abduct and adduct the thumb. Uh, so restoring those is important. That's part of the surgery. It's also important to maintain the blood supply to the, to the digit so that you don't uh, develop an ischemic digit. So you can damage the artery or the venous supply to the index finger as you move it. You can also damage the nerves to the index finger as you move it. It's important to maintain those and not damage those. So the surgery does take some time. It can be very tedious and you may have to use a microscope for some of it. Uh, typically we as hand surgeons will operate with surgical loops or magnifying glasses. They're glasses and they have telescopic loops on them uh, so that you can see finer detail and finer anatomy. In this particular patient, one of her arteries was lacking. And so uh, the blood supply to her index finger uh, hinged simply on one artery. And it was very important to be meticulous in maintaining that artery throughout the entire process. Otherwise the whole surgery could have been compromised. So that's the first surgery example that I have. Um, and I think this is probably one of the most challenging surgeries to do in all of orthopedics. And it's one of the most elegant um, uh, and it, patients tend to do very well. Um, and restoring the, that thumb and the thumb opposition, I think is essential for, for function.